From Advisory Board, we are bringing you a radio advisory, your weekly download on how to untangle healthcare's most pressing challenges. I'm Abby Burns. This week, we're going to be revisiting the episode on site of care shifts that we recorded back in February of this year. In the original episode, I invited Advisory Board experts Nick Hula and Sebastian Beckman to break down just how much site of care shifts are accelerating and why health systems need to adopt an offensive mindset and start thinking about these shifts as part of their growth strategy, not something to be defensive toward. In that episode, Sebastian told us there was more to come with the research his team was doing into site of care shifts. So six months later, we wanted to check back in and see what they've learned. Today, we'll be playing the original episode almost in its entirety, but I've also invited Sebastian back onto the podcast to share what his team's research has uncovered since. We'll kick things off and talk through a couple of updates at the outset, then we'll cut to our conversation. We'll also be interjecting a couple times throughout the recording. Sebastian, welcome back to Radio Advisory. Thanks for having me back, Abby. Before we play our original conversation, I first wanted to ask you, when you heard we were going to be encoring this episode, before I even had the chance to invite you, you immediately asked to piggyback on it and add some additional color. Why was that? I just really love when we say there's more to come and then we get to follow through with all of these different publications. So I feel like when we first talked until now, we've run a bunch of different analyses. We're putting out a lot more publications and I just feel like there's more concrete things to say on some of these points that I really wanted to be able to bring to our listeners. And then as we've continued our research here, there's some additional nuance that we can offer In particular, we've done some more work that specifically quantifies the opportunity for set of care shifts. So you can kind of anchor your expectations for how much of an opportunity this is or how much of a risk this is. Okay. My ears just perked up when you said you quantified the opportunity size, because we talk in this episode a lot about what stakeholders can gain strategically from set of care shifts, which is super important. But since you mentioned it, I think it's helpful to wrap our minds around just how big an impact, an opportunity, or a risk we're talking about. Where did you land with that? So what we did is we looked at all of the procedures that could shift out of the hospital setting, and then how much of a revenue drop that could represent for hospitals. And the number we came to was $50 billion. $50 billion with a B. With a B, yeah. For hospitals that's probably a risk because that's revenue that they're likely going to lose if these things shift. Okay. For health plans, that's a 50 billion opportunity. For ASC operators, that represents the hospital revenue that you can go out and grab if you're aggressive about this in specific markets for specific procedures. ASC, ambulatory surgery center operators. Right, right. So a little bit of a different outcome for each different stakeholder in healthcare. Absolutely. I do think to the point of the episode we brought a few months ago, I would still emphasize that even though it's a revenue risk for hospitals, it could still be an opportunity for health systems. So I think Nick made a really articulate argument about how you can leverage ambulatory surgery centers as part of a variety of different growth strategies. This isn't just revenue you could lose. This is also a potential growth play for health systems. Sebastian, before we jump into the rest of the conversation, are there any specific research outputs that you want to put onto listeners' radar? Yeah, I think there's two. So one is we published a piece explaining how we got to that $50 billion figure and how you can act on it. The second, which is actually still to come, but maybe by the time the episode goes live, will already be published and we can share it in the show notes. Uh, We think this is an area that is going to keep seeing changes um, and sometimes in surprising directions. So we're publishing an annual report where we look at site of care shifts on a regular basis to see what's changed since we last Mm. did this analysis. And we're looking at geographies. So what are the markets that are moving most quickly? We're also looking at procedures and we're also looking at sites of care, um, like hospital versus ambulatory surgery center versus lab versus office. And we're looking at how all three of those categories intersect. And then we're going to provide that regular annual update for our members so you can keep up with what's most important and what's changing most quickly for your organization. At this point, we're going to start playing the original episode from the beginning. You'll hear Sebastian and me jump in a few times to share some data updates and dig a level deeper. For now, enjoy the episode. 
I have to admit, I'm a little curious about why we are having it now. It feels like we've been talking about this impending site of care shift and advisor board has been keeping a finger on the pulse on it for a really long time. Why are the three of us having this conversation today? I think you can scratch the impending now and start to talk about accelerating. So we're talking about accelerating set of care shift now. It's happening more quickly, and it's also starting to affect more cross site of care transitions. Mm. So not just inpatient to hospital, but also that hospital to ASC transition, which is really costly to health systems and a real Mm. savings opportunity for health plans. Sebastian, when you say accelerating, can you just flesh that out a little bit? What do we mean by accelerating? Yeah, so we've been tracking, to your point, set of care shift for a little while. And there's 15 particular procedures that we've kept an eye on because we've thought of them as being at high risk for shift out of the hospital setting. Mm. And of those 15, 14 have shifted since 2017. 14 out of 15. Yes. And of those 14, 11 of them actually saw quicker shift from 2019 to 2022 than from 2017 to 2019. So you can kind of divide pre and post pandemic there. Mm. We already saw outpatient shift happening before the pandemic, but it's happening a lot faster now. So one example of that is joint replacement moved about 18 percentage points from the inpatient setting to the hospital outpatient setting between 2017 to 2019. And that's supercharged since then. It's gone an additional 51 percentage points to that outpatient setting. 51%. Yes. Okay, that feels meaningfully faster. I want to make sure I'm not oversimplifying when I'm defining site of care shift. My perception is site of care shift means the proportion of procedure volume shifting away from an inpatient setting. So more hip and knee replacements in outpatient sites like ASCs. What's missing from that definition? I think that's the basic of it. I think what that hides is that there's a lot of variation between sites of care where you can see shift happening. So you can see inpatient to hospital outpatient. So instead of having that two midnight stay, that patient is leaving within 24 hours. And that's most of what you see happening for those big procedures like joint replacement. But you also see transition from the hospital setting to the ambulatory surgery setting, or even from the hospital outpatient setting to the physician office setting, right? So some of those shifts from higher cost settings of care to lower cost settings of care, and particularly to settings of care where other people are getting paid. Sebastian, let's break in here for a minute, because one thing you were telling me feels highly relevant here, which is that despite the acceleration of set of care shifts to cheaper settings, not all shifts are going in that same direction. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah. So when we had the original episode, we talked mostly about big ticket items moving from inpatient to outpatient. So from more expensive to less expensive. But when we look at the full spectrum of care, there's actually a number of different procedures that are going from less expensive to more expensive sites, Mm. particularly around kind of E&M, lab, those kinds of low intensity encounters. E&M, evaluation and management. Right, right. And when we talked to some of the researchers that looked into this back in 2019, what they highlighted is that they'd heard about physician groups being acquired by hospitals and then having their sites recoded as hospital outpatient departments. Mm, okay. So this is that classic example of, hey, I went to my doctor and had my annual visit and it cost 50 bucks. And then I went back again the next year and it cost 200 bucks. And what changed is they got acquired by a health system. They didn't go to a new site of care, but the new site of care just cost more. Yeah, the, the physical location is the same. But it is coded as a different site of care than it was before. So I know we usually talk about the opportunity to save by shifting cases from the health plan perspective. I think this is an example where health plans might need to be more defensive. Mm. So for CMS, that might mean things like site neutral payments, which are kind of back on the agenda these days. For commercial plans, that's probably about cracking down on reimbursement rates or reclassifications like I just described. So it is not just the proportion of services that are moving, but it is also the range of different places they're moving to. Sebastian, you started off telling us about the massive shift that we saw in joint replacement, right? You said 51% change over the last two to three years. 
what can we learn from what's happened with orthopedics that might be instructive for other service lines? I think there's a couple different perspectives on that question. And okay. one that I've been obsessed with recently is the health plan perspective, because I think there's something that health plans should learn from this, which is it is possible to shift really expensive stuff out of the hospital, even when it never seemed likely before. And you can do it pretty quickly. The reason I say that is joint replacement health plans did not play a big role, to my understanding, in driving that 51% change. Okay. That was about um, a regulatory change. It was about hospitals don't actually lose a lot of money when you go to the hosp in hospital outpatient setting from inpatient, because even okay. though you're taking less reimbursement, your costs are a lot lower too. The physicians were already interested in this, and there was about 10 years on of clinical data backing this up. And then you had a pandemic that gave you an operational reason to get patients out of the hospital as quickly as possible. Okay. But the result is health plans accidentally saved millions and millions of dollars. Accidentally saved. Right, right. By doing nothing, they saved tons of money, which was great for them. And now they know they can do it. So if you're a health plan leader, why not use this proactively? If you're looking at what you can save in cardiovascular care, what does this example tell you? And I'm not saying that things are going to move as quickly in cardiac as they did in orthopedics. There's a lot of fundamental differences in the market. Like the physicians aren't as independent. You actually have to build cath labs outpatient if you want to send patients in the ASC setting. Okay. But there's ways that you can encourage physicians to do that and design benefits to encourage physicians to do that that could help spark that kind of change. Okay. So that is the health plan perspective. What about the health system perspective? Yeah, well, from a health system perspective, they've wanted to preserve inpatient volumes for really as long as they possibly can. You know, they usually get a higher mm -hmm. reimbursement in that setting. And in, in a fee-for-service environment, they just make more money if a surgery occurs in that setting. Um, now, there are obviously you know, exceptions to all of that. But for the most part, health systems want to wait hold off on shifting surgeries to other settings until they are absolutely forced to. But like we were just saying, we are seeing these side of care shifts happen, whether the health system is, you know, gets on mm. that train or not. Um, you know, side of care shifts are accelerating that where that's where the train is heading. And, you know, we're not just talking about super low acuity stuff like eye surgery, you know, cataract surgery anymore. We're talking about things like ortho cardiovascular, neuro, spine. We're talking about things that are really core to the hospital that have really yeah. broad reaching strategic impacts, broad reaching financial impacts. And if health systems aren't paying attention to investing in those areas and really moving in the direction the train is heading for those, they're going to miss out really altogether. Do you have any examples of times where you've seen that happen? Yeah, absolutely. In our research, we spoke with one health system who um, they actually resisted shifting ortho cases to outpatient settings altogether. They resisted that for as long as they possibly could. Um, and what happened was a local independent physician groups, they all banded together to build an ortho ASC. So now for the health mm. system, they're not getting any of their phys those physicians to do outpatient surgeries in a hospital at all. They're all bringing their outpatient cases to the ASC setting. So they've been almost completely cut out of the outpatient ortho market, all because they were trying to resist site of care shifts as long as possible, um, as opposed to really viewing it as a strategic enabler or an opportunity to be a market leader for that service. Yeah, so it's this example where they didn't want to take a haircut, and so they lost the revenue altogether. Right. Mm. So what, we're, what, what I'm hearing is basically there is a market opportunity here for health systems, and it has something of a ticking clock, which doesn't fit all that well with the way health systems have traditionally approached side of care shift strategy. How should they be thinking about it instead? Yeah, so health systems can't view side of care shifts as some necessary evil anymore that they have to avoid at cost. Um, they can't really wait around until they're forced to move things anymore. Uh, I like to think about it as going on offense. 
um, you can think about it as more just like thinking about it as an opportunity uh, instead, you know, really adjusting your mindset to see ambulatory as a as a key part of your growth strategy. Um, so I often encourage a lot of health systems to really identify what are those services or what are those areas that they cannot afford to lose at. Identify what are those areas where you want to solidify yourself as the market leader for that service. Yeah, and by, by the way, I think that's a really important message because it drives home that this matters not just for health systems and markets where they're seeing shift active. It, matters for every single hospital. Most hospitals and health systems could benefit from an ambulatory strategy and it'll help you accomplish things that you couldn't do without one. So so if we're saying health systems need to change their posture towards side of care shift from this is something I'm forced to do to this can help me achieve my goals, right? What are some of those specific goals they should be using this to try and achieve? And the reason I asked the question is moving services, procedures, surgeries to take place in outpatient settings is going to cannibalize, right, some highly coveted surgical volumes that hospitals might rely on to maintain their margins. So what are the potential strategic opportunities that can be gained from making what could be a a pretty painful decision? Uh, Well, service line growth is, of course, a big one. Like I just mentioned, you know, do you want to improve your, you know, Bind program, for example. Well, ambulatory needs to be a part of that equation if you want to have any influence over the outpatient spine market. But there are there are others too. You know, do you have market expansion as a major one of your goals? Mm. Well, if you're expanding into a new geographic market, you don't always need to build out a new hospital. Maybe establishing an ambulatory set of care is a great first step to building brand. Um, another really big one that I see is improving access to care. I see, mm. I, you know, I see a really big opportunity in this for like rural areas, actually. Um, you know, right now there are very few, at least from an ASC perspective, there are very few ASCs in rural areas. Uh, and I know a lot of health systems are you know, closing down a lot of rural hospitals at probably an, an alarming rate. Um, but in some instances, it might make sense to, instead of closing down those sites altogether, to instead convert some of those sites into, you know, maybe it's a freestanding ED, but maybe it's also an ASC. You might not make that much money on that ASC, um, but it might have a really lower cost structure than operating a, a hospital. And so you might be losing a lot less while at the same time maintaining access to a lot of key services for that area, yep. uh, retaining employees, repurposing all the capital assets that you might have. Uh, yep. being able to at least get some benefit out of that to, to achieve those kind of access related goals. I like that point about a care network a lot. So a network mm. of facilities de- delivering the right care in the right place. One of the things that we've heard in the last year is big city medical centers with large rural areas around them are taking in transfers of patients from facilities markets that can't handle them anymore. And then they've got nowhere to discharge those patients because there's also no post-acute infrastructure. So even though generally I try to push us away from thinking about this as decanting volumes to save on hospital capacity, that is still a really important part of the strategy. It's intentional decanting. It's strategic decanting is what I'm hearing from you. We'll be right back with more Radio Advisory. Health systems are feeling a lot of strain right now, between increased demand, workforce shortages, and so much more. To even begin navigating these challenges, healthcare decision makers need to understand the major drivers behind these site of care shifts, the opportunities and risks they present, and the downstream impacts. That's where advisory boards on demand courses come in. With a course dedicated to site of care shifts, you and your team can quickly gain the knowledge and insights needed to navigate these challenges successfully. Visit advisory.com slash courses or check out the link in our show notes to learn more. You're listening to Radio Advisory. I'm Abby Burns. 
So health systems should approach site of care shift strategically rather than solely reactively. You mentioned, though, at the beginning of our conversation, this shift looks different across different services and across, like you said, Nick, different markets. So I'm assuming whatever strategy health systems pursue need to be both service and market dependent. Yes? Yeah, absolutely. So so let's talk about both of those and let's start with the services. And just for some context here, two weeks ago, we talked with Vidal and Larry on Radio Advisory about how for most health systems, the path to growth is actually by focusing on a narrower set of services than they might have done in the past, right? They told us hospitals need to shrink in order to grow. When we're talking about being more strategic around your side of care shift strategy, my mind is kind of going to a similar place. So my question is, how should organizations decide which services they should prioritize shifting to outpatient? Mm. Or should they be doing this for all services? I think there's broadly four things that will determine how fast something can move. So the first is the physician landscape. So how independent are the physicians in this service, in this market? Do they own Mm -hmm. their own ASCs? In other words, is there a financial incentive to go outpatient? To what extent are they beholden to the hospital for all of the care that they provide versus just going there for procedures? Sebastian, do any specialties in particular come top of mind for you when thinking about how consolidated are is a diff, is a given specialty? Yeah, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time doing ortho and cardiovascular research, so all my examples live in those two service lines, for which I apologize. But I think there are actually useful contrasts here. So orthopedic surgeons tend to be very independent. They ha- tend to have ASC ownership stakes. Many of them mm. are already operating out of the ambulatory surgery center much of the time. They can do a lot of their procedures either in the hospital or the surgery center. Okay. Cardiovascular physicians, so interventional interventionalists in particular I have in mind here, are more likely to be employed by hospitals. Most of the time they're working out of a cath lab and their local ASC probably doesn't have a cath lab. Okay. Um, they tend to be a little bit less independent as a result of that employment relationship and they don't have that ownership stake that gives them a financial incentive. Uh, That kind of sets up the second big category in my mind, which is infrastructure, right? So you can do a joint replacement, you can do an ACL repair, you can do that in the hospital, you can do that in a surgery center. You just need, I don't know exactly, like scalpels and saws and other kinds of butchery equipment, I assume. Whereas like a cardiac intervention, you need a whole cath lab. Mm. And that's an expensive investment that the average ambulatory surgery center hasn't made. So that's something that's going to take time to st- time and capital to start up. Um, that also makes me wonder, in this world where you know health system financials are looking better than they did in the last couple of years, but still not great. I think average hospital margin is somewhere in the one to two percent range. Realistically, what proportion of hospitals can make this type of capital investment? So I think some of the larger ones will be will be able to do so, um, but for a lot of health systems. I think the answer for them is you need to partner mm. to make those levels of in, uh, of investments. Um, be that a health system partnering with a physician group or partnering with an ASC operator, you know, these big, big chains uh, of companies who are operating ASC to be able to have the funds in order to start up these ASCs, but also operate them on a continual basis. So it's not a matter of if you can't go it alone, don't do it at all. Instead, it's what is your strategic lifeline? and lean into that. Have you seen examples of this actually working? Yeah, absolutely. We see health systems partnering with physician groups or ASC operators all the time. Um, I think the key to it, though, is to find a partner where you align on cultural values or on shared goals. Mm. Um, You know, for example, if a health system who is just seeing ASCs as a very, you know, defensive maneuver, And they partner with a independent physician group who they really want to make profit off of this. Um, There's a big misalignment in incentives and goals that that to fall apart. Um, On the flip side, we talked with one organization. They were actually one of the, uh, those really big ASC operator chains. Um, And they saw a huge opportunity to expand in a like very specific geographic market. And all of the big local health systems, um, they were interested, but not 
really committed into a, like, a long-term surgical presence in that area. Um, so they, you know, searched and searched and searched and eventually found a much smaller health system in the area um, that for years have been trying to like grab a foothold in that region. Yep. And they ended up partnering with that ASC operator because they shared the exact same goals, the exact same aims. Yep. That made the partnership super smooth because they were able to find that right culture fit, that right priority. The strategic alignment. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So we've got, so we've got the physician landscape. We've got the infrastructure. Sebastian, you said there were four factors. What are the other two? Yes. So the third that I like to talk about is are health plans actively working to accelerate the shift in your market or not? And we've seen this be really market dependent, right? So to return to that ortho example, I talked to a hospital in Southern California who work with a health plan who reimburses all joint replacements at ASC rates. Wow. They're not requiring anyone to do this work in the ASC, but good luck making a margin on that ASC rate if you're still taking care of the patient in the hospital. Um, so that's a really good way to lock in that kind of shift. I think there's other things that hosp- health, health plans can do to accelerate shift. So like I talked about the benefit design yeah. earlier, partnering with particular providers in a center of excellence model um, to take case- patients or cases to that ambulatory setting. But I think that's a third big driver. So is this something that health plans are actively working on, or is it something that they'd be willing to partner on if you can help save that money? Okay. What's the fourth? Is there actually enough volume? Hmm. So if you think about your average physician, they have to choose where they're practicing. If they're only going to do one or two of these ambulatory eligible procedures in a week, it doesn't make sense for them to go to that setting. They're just going to stay in the hospital because it's too hard to set up a parallel schedule to justify that. You need that minimum volume that's eligible for the ambulatory surgery center setting in order to schedule everyone's time around it. And that means that you need to have a large enough market. So so that's a perfect transition to talk about our other bucket of considerations, which is how does this look different market to market? So we have the strategic ambitions how systems might be pursuing. We know what factors they should consider when they're evaluating which services to move. What about market conditions? What, how does the calculus look different market to market? I think you can look at a lot of those same things, you know, physician, employment status, level of independence, that sort of stuff. Um, other things I add to, to the mix there to look at when it comes to market conditions is like looking at local certificate of need laws, mm. especially in really crowded markets with lots of, lots of big players or markets where health systems might have like a monopoly, or like one sim- single health system has like a monopoly. What would a couple example markets of either super consolidated or a place where a health system has a monopoly on on the volumes? Yeah, so I think in you know some like smaller metropolitan areas where really one health system has a dominant play over the market, both in kind of the urban core as well as like suburban areas, um, it might be hard for other smaller health systems to really, you know, form their form their foothold um, and form relationships with a, a more limited pool of, of, of patients and physicians. Are there specific cities or MSAs that come to mind as like, this is a really ripe market versus this market is not going to move? I wish I could give you an answer. Unfortunately, that's actually an analysis that we're still doing. So we're looking at by health referral region, how quickly has shift happened across the last five years. And we're also looking procedure proceed- mm. by procedure for that same information. So we're going to see and be able to share that full level of how macro level, how has the market moved? Micro level, how is there variation between joint replacement versus spinal fusion versus PCI mm-hmm. versus prostatectomy? We'll be able to see that. Um, and we're pu- publishing maps that will show all of that as well. So more to come. Always more to come. And now we have the actual more to come. All right, bring us up to speed. So we published the maps I referenced to the website. And the big thing I take away from them is that it's not just that every market is different. Every service line in each market is at a Mm. different rate of change or is a different state of shift than the others. Okay, so lots to dig into. Let's start at the market level. There are some markets that are clearly ahead of others on ambulatory shift. So, for example, we looked at the total percent of market volumes done outside of the hospital for every single health referral region 
for a set of 15 procedures that we tracked across all settings. Okay. You have some markets like Bend, Oregon, Lakeland, Florida, or Wichita, Kansas, and these are all health referral regions, where around 20% of those procedures are already happening out of the hospital. Hmm. Then you have others like Pittsburgh or Tallahassee, Florida, that are down in the 2 to 3% range. Wow, that's a pretty wide difference. Yeah, no, it's huge. Sebastian, when I go and look at this map on advisory.com, what is the national map with market level or health referral region level data going to tell me about the prevalence of the outpatient shift across the country? It's a patchwork. So like I said in that example, Lakeland, Florida is super far. Tallahassee, Florida is not. So you see a lot of variation across the country. There aren't a ton of recognizable patterns, especially when you start to get down to the service line level. There are some service lines that are way further along in Michigan, whereas others that are way further along in Kansas. Wait, wait, wait. So it's not just that entire markets have shifted. It's that within markets that maybe have shifted 20%, not all service lines are at the same point. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I mentioned Wichita, Kansas earlier where 17% of procedures are done out of the hospital. And in Wichita, that's all about cardiac care. Mm. So cardiac cath procedures are done 19% of the ASC, and that drives that overall proportion. 99% of joint replacements in Wichita are still in the hospital. Wow. Right. So Bend, Oregon is the opposite. Almost half of joint replacements are in the ASC, and that's what drives forward that change. So those are two of the most advanced markets in the country from an ambulatory shift perspective, but in totally different categories. So what that tells us is that ambulatory shift isn't just a geographic force. It's actually at the level of individual specialists. So are there cardiologists who want to move this forward in a market? Are there orthopedic surgeons Mm. who want to move this forward in a market? And that will vary across the country. Can I call out something that we haven't talked about, please. which is consumer behavior. Mm. Um, we ran a survey a couple years ago where we posed that question, would you rather get a joint replacement at a hospital or an ASC? P.S. You get to save $500 if you do it at the ASC. <laughs> and everyone picks the surgery center. I can't imagine that was super surprising given the, right? given the wording of the question. Yes, I too right. would like $500, please. Um, but the... There is an element of when consumers can choose, they will choose the savings. I don't think they have a choice. I think they're going where their physician is doing the procedure or where the health plan says, here's where you get the procedure paid for versus not. So even though that feels really important, I actually don't think it's a driving factor. Nick, Sebastian, we are coming up to the end of our conversation, and I want to make sure that we are incorporating the perspectives from the whole healthcare ecosystem, for lack of a better word. So we talked about the health system perspective around site of care change. We talked about how health plans actually have a really big opportunity to not just lock in site of care shifts, but actually accelerate them. How would you categorize the impact, the role, the opportunities of other healthcare stakeholders in shaping the narrative around site of care shift? Something that Nick talked about earlier is the importance of partnerships in funding ambulatory expansion. And the example he used focused on kind of a upstart health system in that market, partnering with outside funders to enter that market. That could have also been a private equity group. Mm. That could have been a big physician employer who wanted to increase their presence in that market. I think that's the role that those kinds of disruptive players can take here. They can be the money that actually accelerates this shift and they can be, uh, they can spread the operational best practices that makes it a success. Another big player that I want to bring up is life sciences, actually. Um, And really Mm -hmm. any type of company that is selling to uh, to to hospitals and health systems and ASCs because they're going to be the ones that actually enable a lot of this care to take place in those settings. We talked a lot about like things like joint replacement or stenting, PCI, uh, all that stuff today. That's not going to happen in a ambulatory setting unless there's the innovation that allows for it to happen in the ASC setting as opposed to the hospital. Um, and that's a big role that life sciences has to play in enabling site of care shifts. Um, but then they're also going to have to 
really understand what are the needs of their hospital health system provider customers in that space and be able to target their value propositions to that more unique ambulatory setting in a different way than they may have targeted hospitals in the past. Health plans are an accelerator that we talked a lot about, but life sciences, private equity, other players in this space can play just as important a role in driving that change forward. Nick, Sebastian, thank you for coming on Radio Advisory. Thanks for having us, Abby. Thanks for having us. I hope you enjoyed this Encore episode with bonus content. We'll make sure and put the resources Sebastian mentioned today in the show notes of the episode. Next week, we're back to our regularly scheduled programming, kicking off a three-week run-up to our Health System Strategy Summit. Because remember, as always, we're here to help. Next week on Radio Advisory. Climate change is a much bigger threat to financial sustainability than perhaps people realize more systems are starting to think climate change is is a big risk for us we need to shore up our defenses against some of those risks we need to run at sustainability to mitigate those risks but also to make gains in other areas as well new episodes drop every tuesday if you like radio advisory please share it with your networks subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and leave a rating and a review radio advisory is a production of advisory board This episode was produced by me, Abby Burns, as well as Ray Woods, Chloe Baxt, Kristen Myers, and Atticus Rosh. The episode was edited by Katie Anderson, with technical support provided by Dan Tyag, Chris Phelps, and Joe Shrum. Additional support was provided by Carson Sisk, Leanne Elston, and Aaron Collins. We'll see you next week. We decided that Nick is going to host the rest of the episode, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nearly that should be the case. You're actually going to interview Dan, so it's just going to be the two of you taking it from here. (laughs) Want to put numbers on the future of surgery in your market? Use Advisory Board's Market Scenario Planner to see volume forecasts by service line, subservice line, and procedure, and how they vary across sites of care. Create your own market definitions to see customized forecasts, or create multiple to compare opportunities across markets. Like all of our data tools, access is included with your research membership. Click the link in the show notes to access the tool.